Hey folks, another fiery Fermi car today, only this one isn't as hot as the Fermi architecture would suggest. This is the Gen 2 Fermi in the middle of the park variant, the GTX 560. Now back in 2011, Nvidia released the higher end GTX 560 Ti, which was based on the GF114 GPU. A much more refined and power efficient version of the GF104 we'd already seen in cards like the GeForce 460. The card was a hit, with considerable performance boost over that old 460, while running quieter and a lot cooler. At launch though, the GTX it came in at around $250, and that was still much for a lot of gamers, many of whom were jumping ship to the cheaper and much more power efficient AMD cards. A lot has changed in 6 years. Nvidia did what they've done many times before and simply cut down their GF114 GPU to reduce costs and birthed the slightly cheaper card, the GTX 560, which sold for around the $200 mark. Today the GTX 560 can be had for under 40 quid here in the UK, I managed to snag this boxed ASUS version for £25, but it is still a little bit more expensive in the States, hovering around the $40 to $50 mark. What you get from your cut down GF114 GPU is 336 shading units, down from the 384 in the TI, the same 32 ROPs and the same 1GB of GDDR5 memory on a 256 bit bus. The reference speeds of the GTX 560 have a core coming in at around 810MHz and a memory clock of about 1GHz. There is a little bit of overhead here for overclocking and I managed to get the GPU on this Asus model to just shy of 900MHz, it's about 11% increase over the reference speeds, and the memory up by a few megahertz too to 1025, which gives us an effective speed of 4.1GHz. But the lowly specs here don't mean that it's really that bad of a performer, even though it's 6 years old and low end. It did throw up a few surprises, coupled to the Core i5, 4590 and 8GB of DDR3 memory, we first of all jumped into CSGO, a game which the GTX 560 took in its stride. At the max presets, the GTX 560 returned an average of 191 FPS at stock, with the average minimums almost hitting around 160 FPS. Overclocking didn't really do much here, only adding a few percentage points onto the overall averages. It's a nice showing though if you need a card to get into esports titles. Skyrim SE now at 1080p and the medium preset, but with all forms of anti-aliasing turned off, the GTX 560 averaged out in the mid 30s at stock, with the average minimum frame rate almost hitting 30 FPS. Overclocking the 560 here resulted in the average frame rate jumping closer to 40 FPS, while the average minimums hit 30. A solid, if not really, that spectacular shown here, and turning down the resolution to 900p would certainly smooth things over. Prey now and at 900p on the medium preset, with FXAA turned on and 16 times anisotropic filtering, and I was genuinely impressed and surprised to see average frame rates over 60 FPS, even at stock speeds. Now, Prey is a fantastically optimised game, and the headroom here means that dialing back a few of those more taxing settings like the anti aliasing would mean that even 1080p gaming would be a certain possibility. Going back to the 2013 version of Tomb Raider at 1080p on the normal preset, again returned a great experience, even hitting 90 FPS on average when overclocked. Cranking the settings to the high preset returned averages over 60 FPS, but at these higher settings, even when the 560 was overclocked, the average minimums couldn't quite hit 60. On the whole though, it's a really smooth experience and pretty impressive considering the game is 2 years newer than the car that we're testing. Now on to Rise of the Tomb Raider, the sequel to the previous game and a game that taxes even the most hardcore hardware. At 900p on the low preset with 16 times anisotropic filtering and absolutely no anti-aliasing, we did manage to keep above 30 FPS on the average minimums, but the experience was choppy at times. Dropping the resolution to 720p at the same settings, seeing the averages jump to well over 60 FPS when overclocked, and the average minimums much closer to 60 than 30. It should be noted though that running it at 7 720p without any form of anti-aliasing, the game looked absolutely, well, rubbish. And turning on anti-aliasing caused the car to severely struggle, even to the point of crashing. Although the frame rates were higher at 720p, the experience when locking the game at 30fps and running at 900p was actually far more pleasant to play, despite that aforementioned choppiness. Finally, I returned to Battlefield 1 and starting things off with 900p on the low preset. 
I jumped into the campaign again and I was met with, well it certainly wasn't the jarring mess that was seen on Rise of the Tomb Raider, but frame rates averaging above 70 FPS and the average minimums hovering in the mid 50s, a hugely impressive showing for this old Fermi card. Up in the resolution out of curiosity, it returned similarly impressive results with the average frame rate tickling 60 FPS when overclocked and the average minimums still managing to stay above 40 FPS even at stock speeds. The game was entirely playable here and enjoyable and I actually ended up playing through a big chunk of the campaign again with this card. With that said though, it's clear to see that the results here are a bit of a mixed bag. Games like Prey and Battlefield showing that it's still got some gas left in the tank in newer titles, but when it gets pushed over that limit like in Rise of the Tomb Raider, the card tanks really hard. If you can pick one up cheaply and you mainly play esports titles and you just may want to dabble into some of the new AAA games, then it's going to be an acceptable card for that. The only problem with cards of this generation, the old Fermi cards, well apart from the fact that they need two 6 pin power connectors, is that there are a lot newer cards that actually perform better that have dropped to the same price. For example, there's not much of a difference between that 1 gigabyte GTX 750 that I tested last week and what this card can be picked up for. And in this instance, going with a newer architecture is going to save you a considerable amount in power consumption and heat, while not costing that much more and still performing a little bit better. But that's about the gist of it, it's not a bad card by any means, but being about four generations old, there are cards out there at the similar kind of price point which do offer better performance. But that's it for today folks, I hope you've enjoyed this little look back at Fermi. Let me know if you're still rocking the 560 or if you've already made the jump to a newer card. As always, take care and I'll see you in the comment section down below and in the next video.